Welcome to Independent Lens. I'm Edie Falco. What's more American than carrying a gun? Rob Williams asked that question, and it made him one of the most feared men in America. This was the early 1960s, when civil rights meant the Freedom Riders, nonviolent protest. And right there in the thick of it all was big Rob Williams saying, we've tried all that, now it's time for a language America understands. Independent producers Sandra Dixon, Churchill Roberts, Kara Pilson, and Cindy Hill tell the story of a Marine, a journalist, a leader of the NAACP. Almost overnight, he became a well-armed advocate for force, if necessary, to defend your human rights. That's criminal, Williams once said, and I hope I'll always be a criminal. Negroes with guns, Rob Williams and Black Power, next on Independent Lens. Black militant Robert Williams voluntarily returned from self-exile today and immediately was arrested as a fugitive. The reality is that America is not God, America is not the end of the earth, and it doesn't matter what the Americans think, in the final analysis, the truth will come out. Well, I advocated violent self-defense because I don't think you can really have a defense against violent racists and against terrorists unless you're prepared to meet violence with violence. Typical of southern towns. Me, my wife, gone all over town. Everywhere we go, the people would turn us down, Lord, and the bridge rolls down. My father was a railway worker, but they had a system on the railroad. But the boilermaker had to be a white man, and so they could, uh, they would all, the white man could have a heifer. And my father used to do all of this work. The white man was getting the money, and the white man stayed drunk about all the time. In later years, the whites in the community used to always tell me that I should be like my father, that he was a good man, and that he was a hard worker, and he never gave any trouble. I lived out in the rural area of Union County, and when they talked about Rob Williams, we were really young children, and we had mixed feelings about who this man was. Of course, I had some fear, a fear for him and for what it might do for the community, because I lived in a predominantly white community out in the country, and uh, the men and women talked very openly about how they felt what they thought this strange person was doing to upset the normalcy of our community. He's Mr. Boss Man. black woman dance on the street, coming at gunpoint. Otherwise, they make somewhat of a jig. It's like a puppet, you know, when you're dangling a puppet on the string. You're completely reduced then to nothing. And that's one thing that helped set that first thing off in Monroe in 57. That's what set off to God. Then we started to really getting organized and setting up and uh, digging fox holes, and we started getting ammunition. Rob had these guns, high-powered rifles, you know, all we had was 22s and 410 shotguns hunting, you know, and I got a chance to, you know, to use the uh, high-powered weapons and become proficient with them, and he taught us a little uh, 
what they call it, karate or self-defense things, you know, we drilled with him and trained with him. Much of our guard was young. We had guys 16 years old, 15 and 16, some, uh, we had some too in their 40s and 50s, but a good many of them were the very young high school students and dropouts. We were never looking for trouble. You know, as long as we, you're peaceful, we're peaceful. But if you come violent, we have to become violent, you know. Uh, we weren't uh, attacking anybody or fighting against anybody, just protecting ourselves, you know. Had 200 arms, plus we had others who would have been on call, about five or 600 guns, because some people had guns who weren't directly participating, but they were on call if we needed them. I guess he weighed, mm, like weighed about maybe 220 for the time, but I was pretty big. And uh, he was, was strong now. Rob could have handled himself now, I'm going to tell you. You know, he, he could have handled himself. We kids going right on the side, go right downtown, go everywhere right away. He kids 45 right on. Now, where he'd use it now, I don't know. But I guess people felt the same way like I felt. They, they didn't know. So they didn't bother Rob. <laughs> Threatened with death, he walked down the street wearing a pistol on his belt, which would be a normal white Southern thing to do. <laughs> white Southerners, their rights challenged will react with, with uh, vehemence and force. Uh, but for a black man to act as an equal in that way was just unthinkable. He found humor in uh, dealing with the Klan on the telephone. People would call with threatening calls. I remember one time he, <laughs> he heard one of the Klansmen uh, call his own wife's name, Stella, or something like that. Stella, be quiet. I'm trying to talk to this nigger, something like that, you know. And so the next time he called, Rob said, how sweet Stella doing? <laughs> and the man said, what do you know about Stella? I'd soon kill Stella to kill you. When the motorcade would come through a black community, Everybody would pull their blinds and lock up in the houses, and they were afraid. But instead, we came out, and our people would come out and lie and stand along the street with their guns, you see. You know, I think about this courageous guy who dared to deviate from the accepted norm, who dared to say, you know, we're not taking this. You, you're not just going to beat us up. You're not going to fire in our homes without us defending ourselves. And that really is the American norm. <laughs> I wouldn't go nowhere without one. So <laughs> yeah, we had to have guns because they had them. And that's the only way we repelled them is because we outgunned them. We had lots and lots of guns around the house all the time. Um, rifles especially after we organized our rifle club uh people would send us 26 dollars uh donation to buy a rifle for the protection of our community <laughs> 